Okay now, good morning PSW staff, clients, friends, joining us for a Film Scoring Monday, welcome. Film Scoring Monday, of course, is when we look at a movie and I take out the, the music and provide the foley and you come up with the best possible choice. You guys are doing better and better. If you haven't played along, please play along. It's fun for the whole family and the kids. And uh, I, you know, I uh, recommend it. There's no right or wrong answers and I'm always here to help. So, um, you know, uh, never too late to, to join in and dive in in the fun. We had a lot of, a lot of fun, at least I did, have looking at your film scoring results for Merchant and Ivory's uh, Room with a View. So that was, that was great. Um, Today we're going to be doing sort of a darker film. Uh, it's going to be, um, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, theoretically, this we'll, we should be smiling, having a fun time, learning, being excited about this stuff. We're going to go into a dark, dark uh, place in the forest. But today we're going to be looking at the uh, very iconic um, uh, film that actually did terribly at the box office, but that doesn't mean anything, right? Critics, uh, never never was there a statue uh, erected for critics saying all these things. Uh, it's a great film, I think. We're gonna, today we're going to be looking at Miller's Crossing. Miller's Crossing is a film by the Coen Brothers. We're going to talk a little bit about the Coen Brothers today. Maybe you've heard them. Brother and uh, Brothers. Uh, the Brothers Coen. Uh, um, and Miller's Crossing is uh, all those beautiful trees we're going to see as part as a b big part of the film. That's where a lot of the um, killings take place. We won't see a lot of violence. I, I'll make sure of that. But uh, that's, that's kind of where it's at. So... It's it's a it's a film about um, gangsters fighting during the Prohibition era. So they don't say it, but it takes place about 1929, and it's inspired by Dashiell Hammond's uh, Red Harvest and The Glass Key. Dashiell Hammond was a very famous uh, writer, film noir, hard-boiled detective books uh, in the 1930s. Uh, Coen Brothers make no; um, they're very influenced by film noir and. Um, that stuff from the 30s and 40s filmmaking like that. Uh, it comes out in 1990, which uh, it's it's which is not a good year to make it. It's either a great year or a terrible year to make a gangster film because you also have Godfather 3 that comes out, and then you have Goodfellas, which um, even uh, Ethan Coen said is better than Miller's Crossing. So, um, but they're different. Miller's Crossing's a little bit more um, uh, of a personal gangster film, if that's even possible. We'll, we'll try to see if that's possible. And Joe and Ethan Cohen, they're uh, um, usually Joel Cohen's direct, uh, um, is the, has a director credit, Ethan has a producer credit, but they both direct the films. They, um, uh, reading a lot about it sounds like, you know, if an actor has a question, they could ask either brother because both of these brothers sit down in a room, type the script, produce it, um, cast it they're they're kind of one it's like talking to the same person and they finish each other's sentences many times and many times those sentences are very short they don't have much to say about uh, well they have a lot to say but but I think they they kind of let the work speak for themselves um, so the box office was uh, it made five million dollars but the the budget was something like 14 15 million dollars so didn't do well but critically acclaimed um, shot by Barry Sonnenfeld. So the Coen brothers are Jewish brothers, uh, grew up in the 1950s from Minnesota, started making films when they were pretty young, and um, Joel went to NYU, and then his brother Ethan went to Princeton, where he uh, graduated in philosophy, studying Wittgenstein. So uh, smart guys, to say the least. They, um, they've directed and written about 
18 feature films and 15 of them have either been edited or co-edited by Roderick Janes. Roderick Janes is a, is a fake name that they came up with because they edit their own films uh, for the most part. They, um, they, they got their first start in uh, Blood Simple, which is a, a film neo-noir movie in 1984. What they first did was good. They, they got money together to create a trailer and to and and make the movie look great and they got investors into saying isn't this isn't this movie great we just we actually didn't make the movie we made the trailer so do you want to invest in the in actually making the movie so they made the trailer first and then the movie which was very smart and that movie um is is uh um tons of plot twists and horror and uh it, it, their their style is is usually a simple story with with dark humor kind of uh, in, embellished or in, in it. But the Blood Simple uh, got them some recognition at Sundance and the Independent Spirit Awards, and then they went on to make the hilarious Raising Arizona. One thing about them is that they are always reinventing themselves, always doing different movies. Um, You've, you've probably seen um, Big Lebowski came later, Oh Brother Where Art Thou came later, New Country for Old Men, Burn After Reading, A Serious Man, True Grit, the list goes on. Hudsucker Proxy, which is just a brilliant screwball comedy that came out of nowhere that also flopped, but I don't, I don't really think they care that much about it. They're just doing what they think is funny and interesting, and um, I always appreciate that. So they start writing Miller's Crossing in like 1988, 89. They were hired to direct Batman, but uh, Tim Burton took that over. So they they decided not to do that. They wanted to work on their own script, but they did suffer suffer writer's block. So in between this, they spent three weeks, uh, they took three weeks off to write, uh, actually one of my favorite films that they've done, Barton Fink. Uh, that was written during the, in between Miller's Crossing because uh, they, they just didn't know what to do with this little gangster movie. It was called The Big Head at first. Um, and then somebody in the crew said, Millis Crossing's a good name for it. So they went with that. They started the script and the idea of the movie with um, an image that they conceived of a black hat. So we're going to be talking a little bit about hats. Thank God you were probably wondering, when can we get to talking about hats? Um, hats coming to rest in a forest. So they, they kind of came up with this, um, there's gusts of winds that lifts the hat in the air and it sends it flying. And this is how they open the movie and it's a, it's a motif throughout the movie. And it and it's uh, we'll talk about the ending and how it how it relates. But uh, the hat is very important in this movie. Uh, obviously, it's important um, because it's a period movie, and hats were very important. Um, if you think of James Cagney or other actors, Edward G. Robinson, gentlemen always wore hats. And if you lose your hat, then you lose your head. You go crazy. So you almost, perhaps you that that's the symbolism there that you need the hat. Um, and definitely Tom, the main character in this, it needs it. So uh, it's, it's, it's at about an Italian mafia and they threatened to kill this bookie, uh, John Turturro, who's uh, worked with them many times. This is the first time that he's worked with them. And uh, Leo, played by Albert Finney, is the Irish boss. And um, it's, uh, he's dating this girl, uh, 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 Verna, who's played by Marcia Gay, Har Mar Marcia Gay Harden, who is terrific. He's dating her. Tom Gabriel Byrne is, is the main character in this. He's kind of the anti-hero. Uh, he is his right, man, ha uh, right, right hand man. Uh, he starts 
having an affair with uh, Verna, which is not good. Um, but Tom does the dirty work for Leo, and uh, he is going between sides, between being loyal to Leo and also not loyal because of uh, his relationship with Verna, and also working with John Polito, who's the other boss, who was 39 when he filmed this. Um, and uh, so Irish, Italian, gangster mafia thing. Gabriel Byrne said he, he really hated this movie because really, if you if you look at the movie, he gets beat up in every scene. Maybe not hate, hated it, but didn't like filming it because uh, uh, he, he just gets his ass kicked in every scene, which is, you know, funny, but, you know, not funny. The Coen brothers also liked the idea of using the forest as a, as a kind of a place of war. So they exist in this, uh, they don't say it, but it's, it's all shot in New Orleans in 1929, and they exist during this time. But the forest, the, go the gorgeous trees, and there's all the, the great shots. I mean, they, they just, uh, they're ex spectacular filmmakers as, as well as writers. Um, this forest is the setting for, um, you know, being taken out, being killed, being, and so they return to this to do the dirty business here. Uh, their dirty business. Um, so that's what it is. Who's the composer? It's Carter Burwell, who's very famous now, but um, got their start with the Coen brothers. There was a sound design guy um, hanging around when they were doing Blood Simple, and he said, hey, this guy maybe can write some music for you guys, and that's how the relationship started. Um, composer of many film scores, uh, did all of their movies. Um, also, uh, you know, a lot of other stuff, but we're talking about the Coen brothers there. So, um, had some classical music training, but, but more also into blues and jazz and not really, uh, trained in, in orchestral music at that point, but they were like, just do it. So he kind of learned how to use an orchestral score because this music, this movie has some Irish, um, tunes in it and Danny Boy is a big one, uh, that was a classic Irish song back in the day. And um, it's filled with uh, an oboe, an orchestra, and uh, I think it fits it really well, uh, the soundtrack. Um, the main theme for his soundtrack was based around the Irish tune uh, Lament for Limerick. So the scene we're gonna score is the last scene of the movie. This is uh, when John Turturro, Bernie, who's kind of this weaselly guy throughout the movie, is, is is killed and buried. And this is Verna's brother. So um, she's now back with Leo, even though her affair with Tom is, is over and Tom's not, you know, he's, all these characters don't show their feelings in it, uh, but uh, he's obviously not thrilled with her going back to the boss and leaving him. And um, so they have this little burial for, uh, burning out there and they're all together and Leo doesn't really know is is Tom going to come back to work for him he forgives him for this affair what's it, Tom is his own person though he's he's unpredictable and um, even though he kind of worked for Leo works for Leo he's you don't know what he's thinking and Gabriel Byrne is so great great in this so Leo tells Tom that uh, uh, Werner they're going to get married and um he offers Tom his job back, saying, come and work for me. But uh, at this point, Tom, I think, is out of it, out of the game, and he turns his offer down and um, watches Leo, uh, his boss, walk away, and you're left with not knowing what Tom's going to do in the future, if he's going to work for another family, or what, he, what, he's, what is he going to do? I always like these open-ended movies because uh, it provides more questions than answers. So let's look at your scene with the beautiful score by Carter Burwell.
very touching, very emotional. Um, you see the hat, you see them in the in this environment. Um, you see uh, the close in of Tom, and you're wondering what's going to be happening. You know, what is he going to be thinking about? Um, he's kind of this lonely character because he ends up alone at the end, really. I mean, he he doesn't want to go back to Leo. He doesn't want to go back to Verna. He he just doesn't. He's he's ending up with nothing except what does he have? He has his hat. He has his head perhaps um, on his shoulders. Uh, let's take a look at the movie uh, at the scene without the music. So just forest sounds, some walking footsteps. The tone, uh, I want the tone to sound like Carter Burwell's score. I want it to be soft and sensitive and um, orchestral would be nice, doesn't have to be, but something that's a little bit um, melancholy, okay? Melancholy, this isn't epic, this isn't whore, this isn't uh, uh, Mexican. This isn't anything like that. This is pretty traditional film score in the sense that there's heart and emotion and feeling um, in it, but there's sensitivity in it too. So um, think about a good, uh, the best choice for this. Um, and again, if you're gonna send me a long YouTube link, let me know what track it is so I don't have to sift through it. Also because that makes that tells me that you've listened to it. So watch the scene as many times as you need and think of what would be um, a touching moment for the ending. This is the very last scene of the movie. What would be touching and emotionally impactful for Tom's character who's lonely, who's alone, who's did all this killing and all these terrible things throughout it and doesn't know which direction his life's gonna be. Um, I say anti-hero because he's, you know, he's, He's done some pretty bad things in this movie, things that, uh, and I, I didn't, you know, violent things, um, good things, but he's he's an uh, uh, unpredictable, unpredictable guy. So see what you think. Think about it today and get it to me by tomorrow. And um, I'm here for any help if you need it. It's going to be really fun. Coen Brothers, great filmmakers and uh, Miller's Crossing definitely deserves uh, a little class because it's uh, it's personally one of my favorites of theirs it's a uh, um, it's a little it's a little confusing to understand but they are very particular about um, they do what Woody Allen does they 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 write and work on their screenplay so so much that the direction is in the screenplay does that make sense so if you read, if the actor reads the screenplay, reads what they're saying, it almost dictates how you should act. So there's no ad lib, there's nothing like that. And a lot of the direction is in the writing. And uh, of course other people do that too, but the Coen brothers, Woody Allen, they, they spend so much time working on the script and crafting the script that it, it dictates the direction. So, um, so that's that, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Love you, miss you, and see you tomorrow. Okay, bye.